Greetings, and welcome to the Halloween edition of the Sliders Review. Alright, let's address the elephant in the room. I know it's not Halloween, alright, that's long past, but when it came to my Halloween videos, I ran out of time and I couldn't upload everything I wanted to. So that's why I'm uploading them past Halloween. But if you stop and look at it like this, at some point in time, it's going to be Halloween time again, October. So somebody eventually will stumble upon my videos and watch it around Halloween time. So yeah, and I'm here today to talk to you about Goosebumps, the 2015 movie. So this movie is very, very unique for a lot of different reasons. I remember when I first heard this movie was getting made, I was extremely excited because, you know, I am a Goosebumper for life. I love Goosebumps and everything. I talk about it on my channel, especially around the Halloween time. And I've gone through pretty much every Goosebumps episode there is, but there are a few more I haven't done. I'm also a huge fan of R.L. Stein's The Haunting Hour because Goosebumps is created by R.L. Stein. And so when I remember when I first heard of this movie, I was ecstatic until I saw the trailer. And the trailer is basically Jumanji. It's basically Jumanji with the Goosebumps name, a couple of the monsters, and that's about it. And I remember I was annoyed beyond belief when I first saw like the movie trailer. So for many years, I never watched the movie until one time I got Netflix, decided to watch the movie. I'm all like, okay, this clearly still is not Goosebumps, uh, but at least it's enjoyable. Like you can watch it, you can have a good time. That's really the only good thing I can say about like this movie other than you know a couple of the monsters appearing that I remember from back in the day who look very different because they're more like the book and also monsters I've never seen before because those Goosebumps episodes were never created and stuff. And but for the most part, yeah, you can watch it, you can have a good time, you can like you can be enjoyed by watching this movie. But if you're a die-hard goosebump fan, then you might be a little irritated and <laughs> stuff. I still think what they should have done is just adapt every stinking book. That's what they should have done. They would have made way more money with the special effects. The special effects in this movie are great. The only special effects I don't like is the werewolf from like Swamp, uh, a fever swamp or whatever you call it. Uh, and that's the only one I've never, that's the only CGI in here that's like terrible. The, abom uh, the abominable, I can't talk, the abominable snowman, I can't even say that, snowman, whatever you call it from Pasadena, he looks amazing. The mantis from Shocker and Shock Street looks great. Um, and then not only that, but they had so many cameo monsters in here from real life people playing them in suits. And I'm just like, dude, why didn't you get up close and personal on their faces so people can point them out a whole lot better? Because some of them was kind of hard to see. I didn't even know Carly Beth from The Haunted Mask was in this thing because I didn't even see her until I looked online and stuff. And so I am disappointed that they didn't have all the monsters do scarier monstery things, you know what I'm saying? And up close and personal, because they were just basically cameos and stuff. And they pretty much just focus on the ones that could mass produce really fast, like the gnomes and the, well, the ghouls from the graveyard. I thought they was from, um, what's that thing called? Like, um, the dead house, but no, they was like, cause like there are so many goosebumps, um, books and stuff I've never read. Now, gr growing up, you know, goosebumps was my jam and everything. I was part of that generation that like, you know, had goosebumps. I was in the eighth grade middle school and I remember this one dude brought like a goosebump book to school and he got everybody in the class into it like it was just like the craziest thing so like i started buying some of the books and then when the tv show came out i was like oh my god what i read just came to life <laughs> and i was thoroughly amazed by the television show from the old fox kids um network not every episode's great some of the effects are kind of well very outdated um, the costumes were pretty decent and stuff, and some of them were really awesome. 
And I just remember falling in love with the television show. And I remember, like, even till this day, I will still watch Goosebumps and stuff. A lot of the episodes still hold up and everything. And so, when it comes to the movie, because, like, here's the thing. I've talked about this multiple times. If you ever watch my Goosebumps stuff, and especially Goosebumps versus, like, The Haunting Hour. The movie felt more like The Haunting Hour, but for kids. And the movie is geared to kids, which is kind of strange. Why is this movie geared to kids? When it should be geared more to teenagers and adults that grew up with this stuff. They should have made it scary. They should have made it spooky. And they should have made it eerie. But they didn't. Like this movie is a comedy slash horror. But really no horror. And you know it's funny. They have so many monsters in this. But you never really feel scared about them. Like that's the weird thing. Like, the, 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 the cast is in peril and people are running and screaming, but you never really feel scared by them. Mainly because even though the CGI, like on the snowman, is like great, you never feel scared from him because he's just a big old giant CGI monster. And you feel a little bit more scared about Slappy, but the one in the TV show was more scarier than the one in the movie. <laughs> I really thought the one in the TV show was going to straight up kill people and stuff. But the one in the movie was just kind of like, I don't know, like, for one, his appearance is more like the book. The one in the TV show didn't look like the one from the book. But, like, you know, he had a more sinister type voice, but also he had one in the, um, the TV show was a little bit more sinister, too. But it was just like, this one was just like making jokes and gathering monsters and like this and that. And the only problem I have with the Slappy doll in this movie is that his mouth movements don't really match up to what he's saying. It's just like chattering and everything. And so, but yeah, back with like the monsters, I just never felt like they was that much of a threat. Now, the gnomes, for whatever bizarre reason, they was more scarier in this movie because they kept multiplying and stuff. And they just kept, like, consuming and everything. But, like, the werewolf, yeah, it's a werewolf and he's scary, but he looks so cheesy and everything. The werewolf and Fever Swamp from the TV show, even though we barely saw him, like, a glimpse of him, he was more scarier than the one in the movie because the one in the movie is all CGI and it's terrible CGI. It's like the worst CGI I've ever seen for this entire movie. And you know, so, and then, but then when you get to the close ups of all the cameos, they look amazing. So, why didn't they terrorize people a whole lot more? Why didn't like. It was it was the safest horror movie you can ever expect, and it, it really felt like a kid's horror movie. Like there are no stakes really at all, and it's weird because in the TV show you really, really, really felt like they was in peril and stuff, and you really felt scared for those little kids in like you know the TV show, and it's weird because the TV show was produced by Deborah Fonte and she also produced the movie so she knows what she's doing but they made it so safe for little kiddos and stuff and the movie is also produced by a dude who does the Fast and the Furious movie and a couple of horror stuff um Neil Moritz or something like that and the uh, music is by Danny Elfman of all people. Now, of course, R.L. Stein helped produce some of this stuff too. Uh, or at least I don't know if he did or not. I know it's based off his books, but I don't know if I, I didn't see no producer role by him. But he does make a cameo as Mr. Black. That's funny because Jack Black plays R.L. Stein, and you know, R.L. Stein made that cameo. It's a cool cameo. He's just walking along, strolling and stuff like that, <laughs> always wearing black. This. I've never seen that man wear nothing other than black. It's weird. <laughs> and stuff. And, but yeah, so it's like I'm not necessarily disappointed with the movie. Like, I don't hate it. Like, I don't hate the movie at all because I find it enjoyable and I have it on DVD. I have yet to see the second one. I haven't seen that at all, but I heard it wasn't as good as the first. But I am partially disappointed that it just didn't feel scary or spooky or nothing like that. And it's quite a shame because the TV show had people 
Like, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? Because they still play the TV show on Netflix. Or, um, they used to play a lot on television broadcast TV around the Halloween time. It's you can find like you know on YouTube. The DVDs sold like crazy. They used to always be on Best Buy around Halloween time. Like the TV show was the thing, and it's funny that the TV show is scarier than the movie. <laughs> And, you know, I've always said, like, when it comes to Goosebumps TV show, the music was always there. The locations were so exotic looking. And in the movie, it just felt like it was scaled down. Like, the locations didn't feel memorable. They didn't feel, like, they didn't fit the setting in the mood. Um, the music was so hokey and comedic. And, like, you know... It just didn't feel like Goosebumps. Like, it never felt like Goosebumps. And that really broke my heart because, you know, Goosebumps has a certain vibe to it, a certain feel to it. And you can always spot like a Goosebumps, you know what I'm saying? And, but the one thing that pissed me off the most about this movie was all the stupid humor. It wasn't just humor, it was like gag humor. And when you watch the movie, you see that a lot of the adults are comedians and stuff. It really feels like they did improv. Just to make it, like the movie wasn't scary, so why do they need comedy for the little kids and stuff? And it was just the, like the first 20 minutes is just humor, 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 humor. And I'm just kind of like, it's, it wasn't even funny humor at all. It was just weird, awkward, Disney Marvel baby humor, basically. And so that is a problem. Come, I'm, I'm telling you right here, right now. Marvel is infecting so many projects that's not even related to them. Every time I watch like a movie or like a period piece drama, there is an abundance of humor in there and awkward humor. And I'm just like, what is this? When I used to watch period pieces back in Britain, the 1700s, 1400s, stuff like that, um, anything had to do with like cowboys and stuff like the Western, they never had that much awkward, weird humor. And now it's everywhere. And it's because of Disney Marvel. Everybody is trying to copy them. And the thing about Goosebumps, if you ever read any of the books, if you ever read, um, saw the television show, you know, for the most part, it's not comedic. Yeah, it's a kid's show. And yeah, it was in the 90s. And yeah, it was a little cheesy because it was in the 90s and stuff. But it was never humorous. It never tried to be funny. Sometimes there would be awkward moments because some of the cast couldn't act or some of the effects weren't that great. But it was never trying to be humorous and stuff, which is weird that the movies are trying to be humorous. Now, there are a total of two movies, but they are trying to make a third. Now, the second movie, which I still have not seen, I cannot comment on, I've seen clips here and there, and it, uh, uh, like, the voice of Slappy Change and Jack Black did basically a cameo, he's uncredited too, and it makes me wonder, why didn't Jack Black want to return? Was he doing another movie? Like, what's going on? Maybe he just didn't like the first movie or something like that. Um, like who knows, but he only had an uncredited role and he's barely in the movie and they recast the voice of Slappy because he does the voice of Slappy in the first movie. And so like the second movie is about like haunted Halloween or something like that. And Slappy basically makes a bunch of R.L. Stein goosebumps monsters come alive from like posters and masks and stuff he sees in the store. And so like... But supposedly the second one was supposed to be about horror land. Now there is supposedly a third movie that's supposed to get made, but it's very, very, there's not much information on it. And once again, it's about horror land. Personally, I'm not a horror land fan. Like I've talked about it. I like the first episode, the second one where the monsters have like a TV show. That's just kind of weird to me. I still think they should freaking adapt um all the books and make them actually scary and stuff and leave out the humor however i have talked about i think i can't remember what it is it's out of netflix or disney plus probably disney plus 
they're making they rebooting the entire Goosebumps like television show, but it's not like the '90s television show. Instead, it's gonna be like the movie, so it's gonna be Jumanji versus like um Goosebumps style, and I don't want that. Even though I do enjoy this movie, I don't want that. I don't, cause you know if it's on Disney Plus, you know it's not gonna be scary. Cause uh, I watched that whatever that Fear Beyond or whatever that show called um R L Stein show that's on Disney Plus that was not scary. It was a little creepy, but they threw in a lot of life lessons, moral life on um, life lessons, and then it kind of was flat towards the end where it wasn't scary. It was building up to be scary, but they just dropped the ball, and I think that's what they're gonna do with Goosebumps. Now, ironically. Goosebumps was about to be made in 1998 by Tim Burton of all people, but that project soured and everything. And so it took many, 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 many years later for them to bring it on the big screen. And we got the Jumanji version of it. <laughs> now, this movie stars a couple of famous people. One really famous person, Jack Black. I remember Jack Black from when I first saw him and I still know what you did last summer. And he was hilarious in that movie. Some people like Jack Black, some people don't. Um, his R.L. Stein version, it's weird, cause like, okay, if you ever seen R.L. Stein talk in like interviews or even in Goosebumps, you know he has a very macabre way of talking. He talks very slow, he talks very eerie. He gives these like weird creepy stares. The man is like, he's born for like the goth creepness you know what i'm saying and he always wears black that's why he's perfect doing what he does and i, I you know and the dude's just like freaking awesome you know what i'm saying but jack black didn't play him that way jack black played a very manic disturbed jittery type man um and also a bit sinister and everything and it worked for this movie for the first half for the first half you see rl stein as like this like irritable mean person who just wants to be left alone and wants this guy named Zach to leave his daughter Hannah alone and the twist on Hannah was great I did not see that come I didn't even think about that in there I think until the, the twist was revealed I'm like oh crap <laughs> and so like but sometimes he kind of hammed it up a little too much in the movie um, with a little too much comedy. Because then when you get towards all the monsters coming out the books, then his personality completely shifts and change um, to where he's a bit more comedic and a little bit more nerdy and stuff like that. And a whole lot more sillier like well, Jack Black is known for playing. And I think it fits for the tone of this movie. Other people in this, a uh, dude, I, I remember I was so proud when I saw this dude in like this movie. Um, crap, what is that dude's name? I first saw him in The Haunting Hour. Um, Dalen um, Minette. I first saw him in The Haunting Hour. Then I remember when I heard he got goosebumps. I'm like, dude, this dude's all about the R.L. Stein. <laughs> and then he was in 13 Reasons Why. And then he was in Scream 5. I hate Scream 5. But this dude loves his horror type stuff. And um, I would, like he's always good whenever I see him in anything. But he always plays like the same type of like character and everything, you know? In the same type of tone. So it would be nice to see him change it up. Now, this surprised me. Ryan Lee, he's there for comedic relief. He is the nerdy guy who befriends Zack in the movie. I don't even know his character's name. Um, but, like, he's also from The Haunting Now. He's from Imaginary Friend. I don't remember that episode, and I don't talk about that episode, because it's probably an episode I hate. <laughs> but I had no idea he was even in that. And so I'm very shocked about that. Now, A Day Rush... She plays Hannah in this. Now, Holton Sage, she has a teeny tiny role in this movie where she basically plays a mean hot girl. Well, not really a mean hot girl. She just plays a hot girl who doesn't know this one dude's name. And then the Ryan character, um, whoever he plays in the movie, 
he saves her from the werewolf from Fever Swamp. And then all of a sudden, she just falls in love with him and gives him a big kiss on the lips. And then she disappears for the rest of the movie. And you think she will follow the rest of the cast as they're trying to stop the monsters, but she doesn't. That is a waste of talent because I liked her in the Orville season one. And so the other stars in here, just like, you know, other people I just don't even feel like getting into. But, I mean, they're just there for comedic relief, really. And like I just don't, I, I just don't understand. I just don't understand all the humor in the movie. But um, basically, then also there's an alternate ending and an alternate opening. The alternate opening is a bunch of movers and a moving truck, and there's a bunch of R.L. Stein books in there. And I guess one pops open and it's slappy. The alternate ending. Well, actually, let me get through the movie first, what it's about, and then I'll get to the alternate ending and stuff. And so, like, oh, let me point out some monsters that was in this thing. So, some monsters in here that I did recognize. Um, Count Nightwing, the mummy from one of the mummy, like, you know, books and stuff. His sister. What is it? Um, Slappy, of course. The pumpkin head, I was like, ah, cool, the pumpkin head. <laughs> and stuff. And so, like, um, oh, of course, the blob. <laughs> and, you know, they also, they had, the, oh, I didn't even see Carly Beth in there, but Carly Beth's in there. And so, like, oh, the invisible boy. And, of course, you know, Will from the werewolf dude. Now, there are some cool Easter eggs in this as well. As they're like, it's like, you know, Zach, he's in the basement and he's trying to get in R.L. Stein's house because he thinks Hannah, oh, Hannah, also one of the, the ghouls up and things in here. But anyway, the ghost people. So anyway, he's trying to get to Hannah in the house and he's in the basement and his friend is with him. And his friends see bear traps in the basement floor. And he's all like, who will put bear traps in the basement? Duh, it's a tongue-in-cheek reference to stay out of the basement. <laughs> and then while they're in the basement, he sees a cuckoo clock. The cuckoo clock of doom. But I don't think it's the one from the actual pop-open from the books and everything. So that was cool Easter eggs. And then there's the typewriter from um, the blob that ate everything. And... I gotta say, I've used a typewriter before back in the old days, so I'm pretty up there in age. And I've used two different types. I used the big clunky type and the electronic kind of looks like the keyboard from like a computer. And I remember in the Blob the A Everything show, they used the old clunky type, the old school typewriters and stuff. But in a movie, they use what looked like a little bit more of an advanced kind that was also into a briefcase, and I don't like that. If they're gonna go R.L. Stein and him writing on the magic typewriter, why not go the old clunky kind? And plus also what don't make no sense is that the typewriter technically isn't magical. It was the boy in the book, so I don't get that subplot. And um, let's put some, I guess some uh, more monsters that was in here. The bees from whatever that bee book was. Now here's the other monster. These monsters I've never seen before in a Goosebump show. And I've never read them in a book. Now, the movie takes references from the older Goosebumps book. Um, give me, I think, what's the other one called? Like, it'll give you Goosebumps or give me Goosebumps. Something like that. One of the rebooted bump, um, bumps. <laughs> rebooted books. And then Goosebumps, like, what is it? 2000 or 3000, something like that. So they take from different sources and stuff. So that's why some people don't really recognize them, you know, if they read only the old, 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 old school Goosebumps book. And so, like, some other ones were, like, the bees, um, the bog monster, um, some little robot-looking thing, the squeezer, uh, Fifi, the poodle vampire. I had no idea who the heck that was. The ghouls from, like, the graveyard. I thought for sure those were zombies from, like, the dead house, but they're not. Um, jeez, who else was in this thing? Somebody else was in this that I didn't recognize. Um, 
you know, I can't even think about it. But there's, like, so many, like, you know, my... Oh, I saw The Executioner. That's from, like, one of the older books. I remember him. Now, the shotgun on Shock Street, they were not able to do the giant praying mantis in the show. So, that's always something that weirded me out when I kept seeing this thing here. Now, this one Professor Shock person, I don't recognize him. The plants from whoever created those plants in that, um... One book, I don't remember that. I thought it was from, you know, beware, like, you know, or get out the basement, or stay out the basement, but it's not. And so that kind of bugged me when they didn't show those references and stuff. So the movie takes place in Detroit, of all places. It was kind of weird that they would choose, like, a real place to be in as opposed to a fictional place. Because in Goosebumps, they're always in a weird fictional place. And so they're from New York, they're in the suburb, um, suburbs, and so Zach and his mom have moved there, Zach don't want to be there, his mom's the new vice principal at the school, and Zach is kind of embarrassed by that, because he's going to be the new kid, Phil, he's going to get bullied, and his mom's the vice principal, stuff like that. There's tons of humor, and he meets a boy named Champ, that's that dude's name. And his short for champion. And he's just a big dork. And so he just wants to like hook up with girls and stuff like that. And they're having some type of dance that day. And so, or that night I should say. And he gives Zach a, like a um, card, like a business card with his name on there. And talking about, hey, yo, man, like, you know, we should hang out, give me a call, stuff like that. Basically, he has no friends and stuff. And so, like, when Zach goes home, and he sees a girl named Hannah, and she um, spies on them, and he talk, and they talk to each other, and then his, her dad, R.L. Stein, is really rude. He doesn't want her talking to nobody. He's overly protective and everything. This was kind of interesting and odd, because he goes by a different name. Um, he doesn't want nobody knowing who he is. And so, like, another day... Um, he sees Hannah again, and she's all like, let's go out to, like, you know, a special place, because he's bored and wants something to do. And so she takes him to where she likes to hang out, a Ferris wheel. And they climb all the way on the top of the Ferris wheel. And, boy, that would have scared the piss out of me. <laughs> I don't like those things. I was on one of them things that, like, I, I used to go to, like, this fair, like a county fair. And they put you in this thing. It's attached to a rope. I think, okay, this is fine. I'm up in the air. It's a little scary, but whatever, you know? And so it's moving around. Like, okay, still not bad. Then it starts flipping and turning around and, 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 and whiplashing. I'm like, <laughs> And this woman who was next to me, she could, I was about to throw up, man. Now, and she just put her arm around me because she see, I was like, like, I just, I could not handle it. I don't like that. I don't like heights. I don't like that. <laughs> Needless to say, I've never done that again. <laughs> But I was forced into doing it. <laughs> My mom's all like, look, if I paid for this band or stamp to go on your hand so you can ride every stinking thing here free, oh, you're going to ride every stinking thing free. <laughs> I was sick like a dog. <laughs> and so, like, after that, uh, one night he overhears, like, you know, Hannah and R.L. Stein arguing. So he tries to like, you know, go over there and R.L. Stein doesn't want him there. So then he hears it again and he calls the police. Now he has an aunt and his aunt is just there for comedic relief. She's a comedian. Her stuff seems like improv and it's just kind of like it. Ugh, I don't want no comedy in this movie. So anyway, the cops go over there and the cops are comedic as well. They're idiot cops and everything. And I'm just like, what in the world? Who is writing the humor in this? And it's not even funny. It's just awkward and weird. And so, like, they assumed that he was just watching a movie really loud. So his mom is gone. And, like, because, you know, it's the prom night thing, dance night. So she has to be there. And his aunt um, babysits him. Which is kind of weird because he's a teenager and he's being babysat. So that's just kind of weird. However, it does play into that formula of R.L. Stein books where the kid goes off with a relative and stay with them for like a summer or something. And so I like that little reference in there. So he sees them arguing again. He knows for a fact that the girl he hung out with is an imaginary and stuff. And so he calls champ over and so him and champ they go and investigate and champ is supposed to be the lookout but champ is literally just a coward he said he was born to be scared and so 
they go through the basement they go in rl stein's house and so this pairing is just like an old school formula of rl stein where it's always a pairing and stuff of two kids doing something normally it's a guy girl but this time it's the guy guy which is very rare in rl stein's book and so when they're there champ notices a bunch of manuscripts there are goosebumps book and he realized this dude must be rl stein but he doesn't understand why there's a lock on the uh, books. And he keeps obsessing over the lock on the books. So Zach is just like, you know, well, fine, I see a key. If I open this, will we find Hannah after this? He opens it and then boom, a tornado comes out. And um, no, 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 wait. The tornado doesn't come out yet. I think it's like something happens. Hannah scares them. And she's all like, don't open that book. And he's like, why? And then he opens it and a tornado comes out. It's the abominable snowman. I cannot say that. <laughs> and of course, it tries to like get them. And he like runs out the house and stuff. And she's all like, you ain't supposed to open the books because, you know, they're real and blah, 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 blah. So now it's a monster chase of trying to catch this snowman thing and trying to put them back in the book when they go to like the skating ring to hunt that dude down something happens the night of the living dummy pops open the key was not used for that it just automatically pops open somehow it's never explained but you know exactly who is in that book and stuff and so like they try to capture the snowman but they aren't able to but somehow rl stein knew they would be there and he shows up and i'm not even sure how the world he knew that but he saves them and everything and so after that um when they head back to the house they realize all the books have been open and stuff not only have they been open but uh, some of them have been burnt and so like slappy has released all the monsters and he's burning the books so they can't go back in the book so Slappy wants to cause chaos in the entire city. He goes to the police station. He has these alien monster things freeze them. I don't recognize the monsters. Um, and then he has the cell phone towers like destroyed so nobody can get like a reception out. But some people have landlines, you know what I'm saying? And not only some people have landlines, they have the internet. So R.L. Stein said, oh, that's exactly what I would do. Take out like the, the towers and everything so nobody can get like a call out. Why would he do that? Why is he so sinister? <laughs> it's never explained really. Well, it, it kind of is. But anyway. Okay, yeah, you take out the cell phone towers, but you have a landline. Some people still have those. And not only that, but people have the internet on their computers and tablets and stuff. So they could have got a message out. Big plot hole right there. So anyway, um, as they're driving around. Uh, oh, that's another thing. The haunted car is a monster in this movie. I don't even know what that is because I've never seen that in like the show. But anyway, um, so Slappy's driving around in that. And so, like, he keeps calling R.L. Stein Papa and everything. And he feels like a neglected child because R.L. Stein locked him and the rest of the um, monsters in the books. So he wants revenge. So in a way, R.L. Stein explains to the kids why he created these monsters. He said growing up, he's always been weird. And because of that, he's been bullied and he had no friends. So he created his own friends. And so he started typing one day, but it turned out that the monsters came to life on the magic typewriter. And so he just kept creating monsters and monsters and monsters. And then he sold, I think, 400 million copies worldwide. And it's funny because they keep making reference to Stephen King twice or three times in it. And he's all like... I have sold more books than like Stephen King and blah, 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 and everything. And he talked about how like, and then, so it's weird because it's like, it makes me wonder, do Stephen King and R.L. Stein, do they have beef in real life? I have no idea. I've never read anything about that. However, it is something interesting. The fake R.L. Stein said that he was bullied as a kid. Now, in this movie, there are no bullies, really. There's kind of one towards the end, but not really. And in classic R.L. Stein fashion, there are always bullies in his books and in the shows. And I've mentioned this before. Like, I've always wondered, was R.L. Stein ever bullied as a kid? Because there's always bullies in his books. And the fact that the fake R.L. Stein in the movie said that he was bullied as a kid makes me wonder if the real one really was bullied and stuff. 
Now, one thing that's never made no sense to me about this whole magic typewriter thing. He created the monster, saw it was um, alive, and then he just kept creating more monsters. But why did he create monsters and monsters only? Not only that, but how come none of the people in his books came alive? That didn't make no sense. Why is it only the monsters and stuff? And that's never been explained in the movie. So where are the kid heroes from like, you know, the books and stuff? Not only that, but I always wondered, well, how exactly did that? Well, he printed the paper. I guess he like attached them to like the book and this and that. But here's the craziest thing. It's never really explained how this typewriter work, um, work, <laughs> works and how the books work. So it's like, okay, he types the um, story out on the typewriter. And so then he puts them in a book and then all of a sudden, magically, I guess they come up. No, he types them first and then they come alive. And then somehow he puts the paper um, in the books. But when they come alive, all the ink is off the um, pages. So how does he know which pages to put the, um, correctly in the book? And then he opens the book and they get sucked in. That is the weirdest plot um, I've ever heard. Like, because why would he constantly create monsters and stuff? Where are all the humans? Where are the human heroes? Um, if we can, could we literally see the ink come off the pages and create the monsters when you know the books are open? So technically, and then they're blank. So how did he know which page to put in the book? And also, how does he know the book is gonna bind? And, you know, and buying these monsters and stuff and the locks and this and that. And why is this one key so special to open it? It's the biggest, like, plot error type thing I've ever seen in the movie. And it's never explained. And so, like, because we see them use the typewriter towards the end of the movie. And then once they take the page out, they just put it in a blank book. And then all of a sudden it works that way. And I don't understand how. And then also when it comes to the actual typewriter from the books, like the real books, um, it's not the typewriter that makes everything come alive. It's the actual dude who's typing it and stuff. And cause it's his imagination that's so powerful and stuff. And so I've never, that's, 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 that's the weirdest, weirdest thing in the movie that I've never understood. And when he saw that they're all evil and trying to kill people and stuff, why did he keep creating more? That don't make no sense. And so like, yeah, that just don't make no freaking sense. <laughs> Not only that. But after he typed their thing and put it in the books, he had to mass produce it. So he would have to give the copy manuscript to like the publisher and they would have to like, you know, create millions and millions of copies. But once they open the books, why didn't the monsters recome back alive and everything? This could explain why he lives his life in seclusion. He's always moving around. And when he got discovered by like Zack and Champ, he's all like, all right, Hannah, it's time to move again <laughs> and everything. So that could explain like in the past, he caused a lot of chaos. But if he caused that much chaos, people would know that and he would probably be arrested. So this is like the weirdest plot thing ever that was never written so well. So and so they go all around town and they go to the school because I guess the monsters always want to follow R.L. Stein because Slappy makes them. And so, you know, they have to confront like the monsters. Champ saves that one girl by biting the werewolf because apparently he has like silver fillings in his mouth. I don't get that. If you put silver in your mouth, then isn't that technically poison? Uh, whatever. Anyway, so. Um... They go back out to the Ferris wheel, they make a distraction so them, some of the monsters get blown up. But if the monsters get blown up and everything, they just reconstitute that. And so, like, um, they go to the Ferris wheel. R.L. Stein can no longer type on the typewriter because Slappy smashed his fingers. And so, Zack has to do it. And R.L. Stein tells them, you know, it has to be a legit story with twists in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, and stuff like that. So basically what it is, is that they're just going to say all the monsters are trapped all in one book and this and that. Well, it turns out when they was outside one time, the moonlight shined on Hannah. or The, the moonlight reflection was out and about, like a full moon, and Hannah started to glow. 
Hannah is an R.L. Stein creation that he created to be his own daughter. She's the ghost next door. One of my favorite episodes and stuff. And he said he wrote Hannah in a way that she knows that, you know, she would be a real girl and stuff and want to know she's a ghost. And that's how, like, you know, the actual book is. Because when she dies in a fire, and she doesn't even know she dies in a fire, and she just keeps living her life as a normal girl until she starts realizing weird stuff is happening. I've already talked about that episode. So anyway, go watch that video. And so Zach notices that. And, you know, then when Zach is like, you know, and then the other kids, they see that Han oh, 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 Champ actually sees that she's a ghost too. So in a way, when he has to write the stories, he doesn't want to put the paper in the book. Well, he puts the paper in the book, but he doesn't want to open the book because he knows Hannah's going to be sucked in and everything. And so like, he doesn't like want that, but she keeps saying, you know, look, man, I know what I am. Like how many sweet 16 birthdays can you have and everything? And so... The book gets open and all the monsters get sucked in. Some try to like, you know, stay like Slappy and stuff like that. And he holds on to Hannah, but all the monsters have to literally go in the book. So they close the book. Day is saved. Next day at school, um, R.L. Stein now has a teaching job as an English teacher and stuff. And Zach is sad. He misses Hannah and R.L. Stein's all like, you know, I miss her too. But she's in our minds. She's in our hearts. And she's right there. And then, so it's Hannah and everything. And one of the things that she told Zap before she got put in the book is that she always wanted to have a dance and everything. And so she kisses him on the lips in the ghost like state. And so now she's back in the flesh. And R.L. Stein's are like, eh, I might have written one more book <laughs> and everything. And so Hannah is now out of the book and she's kissing Zach and now they're dating and all this other stuff. And then as R.L. Stein is walking away, the typewriter starts to magically type by itself. And it says, revenge of like, uh, my best friend ghost or something like that. Or the invisible ghost, you know, um, Brent and everything. The one who's like a trickster. Brent is human and his world got invaded by aliens. So some people, um, and then the aliens look like humans. So his parents created a device that made him go invisible. He befriended this one boy and kept playing, kept playing pranks on him as a ghost. And then the aliens found him and everything. I thought about that too. Go watch that. So somehow the invisible boy escaped being put inside the book. I'm not exactly sure. It's never explained how. Now, to be fair, he did say all the monsters go back inside the book and technically the invisible boy is not a monster he's just a human boy who is invisible but also hannah is technically not a monster as well hannah was a real life girl who died in a fire and got turned into a natural ghost but a ghost is considered a monster so that's probably why she got placed in there and then it ends now there's an alternate ending in the alternate ending well, actually, before I get into that, let me just say Hannah being back in the flesh and dating Zach, I don't like that. It loses all the stakes and it loses the moment of sadness when Hannah got sucked in that book and gave him a, uh, a kiss goodbye and everything. Now it's just like, ah, oh, we give him a nice happy ending and everything. And that kind of sucks, you know, but whatever. But the alternate ending is exactly the same way, but Hannah is not alive. Hannah's still in the book. And there's another girl uh, who talks to Zach and Zach's are like, oh, I recognize an R.L. Stein creation when I see one. So he puts the girl outside like near the light and he's all like, oh, you're real. And so Zach's like, you know, little dude, I'm sorry, man. I've um, been through like the craziest night. And R.L. Stein's like, go date her and stuff. And then R.L. Stein walks by the typewriter. And instead of the invisible boy, it's revenge of like the living doll or whatever. And it's Slappy typing on the computer in the invisible. And R.L. Stein is scared because Slappy's going to make his return. Now, it doesn't explain how Slappy is able to type on the typewriter and he's still inside the book. And so a test audience saw that and it's all like, we don't like that. However, I kind of do like the alternate ending. Um, like I said before, Hannah come back alive that loses all the value and the sadness and the stakes. Um, 
However, the ending was played too comedic and everything, with him trying to put her in the light and see if she glue and everything. Now, Slappy coming back to get his revenge, that makes perfect sense and everything. And But they squashed that, and instead it's just the Invisible Boy pranking people, which made no really no sense. And so I think the test audience were just a bunch of kids who didn't grow up with goosebumps <laughs> and stuff. But all in all, like I said, the movie is enjoyable. Like you can watch it and you can have a good time, but it doesn't feel like goosebumps whatsoever. And that's the real sad thing about it. And, you know, and it's sad they're going to make a TV series very similar to this. Now, hopefully, if they're smart, then there'll be kids who open up a book. And instead of monsters coming out, they get sucked into a book. And they get to live out the story. That would be better. But I don't know what the TV show is going to be about. All I know is going to be similar to that of the movies. Now, wasn't that spooky? All right. Well, I shall talk to y'all later. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>